Good morning. It seems that everyone's warmed up, made some new introductions, met some uh, new folks. So welcome again. My name is Roger Mark D'Souza, and I direct the programs on global sustainability and resilience here at the Wilson Center. Many of you know that we serve as a living memorial to President Wilson, established by Congress. And we're really pleased this morning to host a conversation and dialogue on water security in the Middle East, a source of tension or avenue of peace. And I could deconstruct that title and say each component of that title is so important and relevant right now. Water security, the Middle East, tension, peace, why now? So I think this is a perfect way to start your day. So thank you for, for joining us. I think we're particularly pleased that we're able to host our colleagues uh, from EcoPeace Middle East, who for more than 20 years uh, have been really thought and action leaders on environmental peace building and transboundary water management. Every time they're in town, we know that we want to feature them at the Wilson Center. We hope that you consider this your home away from home thank in you. Washington. Washington, D.C. Um, we're particularly pleased that we have enthusiastic supporters of this work at USAID as part of our Resilience to Peace project with USAID's Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation. And we will be highlighting um, Eco Peace's work in a forthcoming animation that we will be producing on water and peace building, illustrating the connections between water conflict and opportunities to build peace. One of the great things about the Wilson Center is that we host not only extraordinary partners, but also extraordinary fellows. And these people tend to be superstars. So we have one of our uh, senior fellows with us, Sherry Goodman, who is a superstar. She's an executive, a lawyer, former defense official, Senate Armed Services Committee staff professional. I'm very proud that she's currently a senior fellow with our program and a dear friend. So I'd like to kick off this morning's session by asking Sherry um, to give us some introductory remarks. So Sherry, welcome. Thank you very much, Roger Mark. And it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. And I see many good friends and colleagues. And I'm, I'm just delighted to be here and to have this distinguished panel. I want to thank all of you for coming here today to discuss this critical topic of water security. Um, I want to thank first our, our panelists who have uh, come from the region and for your excellent work. Gidon, who I first got to know um, a few years ago, but I've known through my colleague, Ladine, who worked for Gidon for many years. I've known of your work. Um, you're one of the three original co-founders of EcoPeace Middle East, the vision of which grew out of your work, uh, your, your um, let's say, lawyer, your legal degree here in Washington, as I understand it, where you wanted to protect or save the Dead Sea and the Jordan River. And you know, many of us traveled to the region starting when we were very young, so it's sort of imprinted on our brain, sort of, and in our muscle memory, the importance, um, you know, for um, for for everyone of these Nash really global treasures in the region. And you wanted to take an ecosystem approach, as I understand it, um, by having this basin designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Now, that's quite some vision. Since that time, more than 20 years ago, Gadan worked with co-founders from Jordan, the West Bank, originally from also from Egypt, to found EcoPeace, which has as its mission to use cooperation over water as a means towards environmental peace building. We'll hear more about uh, your efforts from our panelists momentarily. Um, and your work's been recognized by Time Magazine. Yana um, is a Jordanian Deputy Director of EcoPeace Middle East. She received a bachelor's degree in archeology span from the University of Jordan. As regional project manager at EcoPeace Middle East, she leads EcoPeace's projects and advocacy, including serving as a liaison to and lobbying governmental and private sector figures and organizations on major regional policy issues relevant to environmental protection and national and regional water issues. Uh, Dr. Shira Yaffe, we're very fortunate to have Shira here, who uh, is a senior policy advisor for international programs 
now at the U.S. Forest Service, but she's here in her personal capacity. Um, in her previous position at the U.S. Department of State, she serves as a lead negotiator on multiple environmental and scientific policy fora. She has a Ph.D. in geography from Oregon State with a specialization in transboundary water resources and a master's from the Fletcher School. I think there's a little Fletcher mafia going on here. Um, her doctoral dissertation research consisted of a project entitled Basins at Risk, which examined trans transboundary water basins and the likelihood for political conflict, examining an extensive number of different factors, and her work is still very relevant today. Uh, Dr. Yaffe's published multiple peer-reviewed articles on international water cooperation and conflict. So, you know, one of the things you see we, we try to do here at the Wilson Center, because, you know, Roger, Mark, and I, and I see our colleague David Reed from WWF here, many of us have been kind of toiling and others, but, you know, we want, we're also trying to cultivate the sort of next generation of leaders and scholars in these important related environmental security, water, climate security fields. So, Shira, you are that. And I would like to also thank Lauren Herzer, Risey, because you helped organize this event. You're a senior program manager here, Ben and Julia and others who put this together, and Ladine Freemuth, uh, who is now a new global fellow with us here at the Wilson Center in the Global Women's Leadership Initiative. And she was the deputy director of EcoPeace's Middle East Israeli office um, back in 2007-2008. Now, um, Water, in my, I'm a, as you've heard, I'm a national security person. That's where I have spent the core of my professional life. And in my view, water is growing exponentially as a national security strategic consideration. And I think it's very important for us, particularly here in the U.S., to conceive of it that way. Uh, in fact, President Trump has said water may be the most important issue we face for the next generation. Okay? And we know, and we're going to hear more about this from um, Gidanyana and Shira, droughts and other extreme events are exacerbating marginal living standards in many Asian, African, and Middle Eastern nations where widespread political instability and failed states already are national security concerns. Depletion of groundwater resources and poor water management are putting people at risk around the world. And we are experiencing more and more frequent extreme weather events. And this constellation of events and water mismanagement, water insecurity, uh, is becoming more and more of strategic importance. Ten years ago, when I founded the CNA Military Advisory Board, a group of um, now over three dozen generals and admirals, U.S. admirals, who have taken a hard look at climate change as a national security issue. We characterize climate change as a threat multiplier for instability, especially in fragile regions of the world. And in addition, we said the connections and interdependencies between these issues, climate change and population growth, and between water and other resources such as food and energy are also growing. Um, Extreme events in an already resource-scarce world are anticipated to further reduce water supplies and agricultural productivity. In fact, according to the National Intelligence Council's report in 2017, Global Trends, the Paradox of Progress, more than 30 countries, nearly half of them in the Middle East, will experience extremely high water stress by 2035. And in turn, such factors could lead to mass movement of populations within and or across political boundaries, increasing potential for instability and conflict. Both the 2012 Intelligence Community Assessment on Global Water Security, another important U.S. document, and the 2017 Global Trends Report highlight negative and destabilizing effects that water insecurity will have on countries of strategic importance to the U.S and the increasing threat it will pose to the U.S. and our allies should we fail to act. Global water security is one of the greatest challenges of our times. That's what it says. However, the challenges with challenges come opportunities, and that's what we're here about today. The opportunities um, for political will and leadership in this space are growing. Um, in other words, the world today is characterized by both unprecedented risk 
but also we have unprecedented foresight, which is what I give Gidon, Yana, and Ecopeace much credit for. We see that this problem is both solvable and being solved across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East, most importantly for today's discussion. Much more needs to be done, and we need greater urgency. That is the global, um, that is the global uh, trends report. So one vision for this future is a water secure world where people have sustainable supplies of water of sufficient quantity and quality to meet human, economic, and ecosystem needs while managing risks from floods and droughts. Now in elevating the role of water security, I have written with some of my colleagues here at Wilson that we need to enhance hydro diplomacy. Hydro diplomacy. Improving hydro diplomacy is about developing Mutual trust before bad things happen, never an overnight process. That's really what we're going to learn about today, that, that successes in hydro diplomacy can create mutual confidence for addressing less tractable diplomatic challenges, particularly in the Middle East. It's what our old, us old cold warriors would call confidence-building measures. Um, in fact, we hope uh, that... Um, we will have this strategic objective of reducing conflict by promoting cooperation on shared waters. And in that regard, we called for creating a water conflict prevention center, a focus on water conflict prevention. And um, we believe that now is the time with a number of great opportunities coming forward and EcoPeace sort of pointing the way um, and a number of other forces developing, watch this space in the US. I think there's some good news that may be coming forward. But you know, so here's the spoiler alert. It's not all doom and gloom. Um, we're celebrating the firsthand experience of EcoPeace Middle East, which has been proving these points under the toughest of circumstances for more than two decades. First, we are celebrating the success of EcoPeace Middle East which has worked for two, nearly two decades with Palestinians, Israelis, and Jordanians who've been co cooperating on concrete water resource management projects such as a means of peace, towards a means of peace building. We're also celebrating the launch of EcoPeace's program on water security, which will establish a presence here in the US for EcoPeace Middle East to build on and share its lessons learned and best practices with other parts of the world, such as Sri Lanka and the Indo Indus Basin, India, Pakistan, where um, FOMI has made inroads in the past. And in fact, some of EcoPeace's solutions are highlighted in USAID's water conflict and peace building toolkit suggested in the background reading for today's event. Um, so FOMI has demonstrated that interdependencies among peoples over water resources can result in lasting solutions once parties build trust among one another. Such interdependencies are the only source for what I've referred to as, a, as sustainable security for the 21st century. EcoPeace has demonstrated with leadership by example that nations that otherwise do not agree on much of anything, we know how challenging um, uh, things can be in this region, can come together on an increasingly resource scarce world over the precious resource of water which is essential to the very essence of life, and cooperate towards extremely practical solutions towards cleaner water, better management of limited local and regional water resources, and more broadly towards greater water security and peace building. They are, you are showing that these experiences can be adapted and shared with other parts of the world, um, and I'm looking forward to your sharing these specifics with us. As Gidon has said, um, and you said yesterday, your neighbor's water security is your national security. I love that line. I'm going to steal it from you. Um, so this is a very important message and um, one that I think we can all take to heart and that I think we can use together to help build um, greater water security cooperation starting with your terrific example. So I want to thank you each for being here today, and I look forward to this excellent discussion.
Thank you very much, Sherry. I think um, highlighting the challenges and opportunities, and I think Sherry has teed up the panel quite well from hydro diplomacy to interdependencies to leadership by, by example. So, Yana, I hand it over to you to um, kick us off. Wonderful. Uh, good morning to all. Um, this is a great opportunity, and I thank you all for making it today and uh, um, to hear about EcoPeace and what we do back in the region. Uh, to start, I would like to very much li uh, thank um, Sherry and Roger for making this happen. Um, this is a yearly event that we have. Um, we speak at the Wilson Center every year, and this is my first time speaking, um, so thank you very much. Welcome home. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> EcoPeace, who are we? I can say that we are a unique regional organization, the only regional organization that brings together Jordanians, Israelis, and Palestinian environmentalists with one objective, to protect the shared environmental heritage, more focused on protecting the very few shared water resources that we have in our region. In doing so, we seek to advance both sustainable development that's much needed in our region, but to also build the necessary conditions for lasting peace that we much need also in our part of the world. How do we work? I can also say that our approach is also unique because we're not only a top-down organization, meaning we work with our respective governments and authorities in each of the countries, Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, where we create research. We bring researchers from the three countries together and create policy briefs to put pressure and understanding on our local governments to move forward on regional solutions that are identified in the research. Since we were established in 94, we started with our top-down, dealing with the governments, working on uh, research and uh, producing policy briefs, publications, but then we discovered that we need more. We need to involve the communities, the residents, the people that are most affected by the shortage of water that we are facing in our region. So our, bot uh, uh, our bottom-up approach is all about educating local constituencies and have them lead necessary cross-border solutions to the regional water issues that we face in our region. So I was saying that our major focus is uh, on our very limited shared water resources. The Jordan River that is shared between Jordan, Israel, Palestine receives a lot of our attention and our work. We focus mainly on the lower part of the Jordan River. Okay, I can't see the pointer anymore, but which starts from the Sea of Galilee all the way to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea also that is shared between Israel, Palestine, Jordan. And our bilateral work concentrates on the mountain aquifer shared between Israel and the West Bank and the coastal aquifer shared between Gaza and Israel. We saw in the previous map that the border between the three countries is the Jordan River. But those are not our real borders. Our watersheds are our real borders. So this is what we need to be working on in order to achieve cooperation over our limited water resources. We need to manage together our limited shared waters. 
Every time I look at this photo, I get, I can't believe. I, I mean, I, I would say, um, is this the case? Did we really ever have a Jordan River that could be this mighty with so much water flowing? Before the unilateral decisions of each country um, to divert its water, 1.3 billion cubic meters were running into the Jordan River, flowing into the Jordan River. You can see, um, sorry, <laughs> this picture here, and I can't see the pointer, but on the bottom right, is, uh, shows the mightiness of the river, where an Amel uh, American colonel lost one of his four boats to the mightiness of the flow in the river. The first ever hydro power station was built using the waters of the Jordan River, producing over 40% of the electricity needs to mandate Palestine. This is what I believe and, and see as, um, this is what's remaining in the Jordan River. So over 96% of its water have been diverted from Israel, Syria, and Jordan. Over four, the only remaining 4% that is flowing into the river today is sadly all saline and sewage water. That's what's keeping the river alive at this time. Our good water neighbors. I mean, I was talking about the uniqueness of our organization in working with communities and residents. Uh, uh, of the communities that share the water resources across the border. Our flagship program that has been going on since 2001 is the Good Water Neighbors, where we work with all levels of the communities. We work with mayors, and we can see here mayors coming together, jumping into the Jordan River, not because they have a love relationship, but because they understand that if they don't work together, on the issues of rehabilitation of the river, they're not gonna succeed. They're all gonna lose. But we also work with youth in the communities. We empower and educate the youth on the importance of them working with their neighbor in order to achieve uh, 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 trust building that is the first step towards working together and cooperating over their shared waters. We also work with the adult residents in the communities, educating them about their water realities and the need for cooperation. Well, this is the case, but we work hard. We have many challenges, of course, but we are able to advance. We are able to make many progresses on the issue of the Jordan River. So for the first time ever in 60 years, the Jordan River is actually seeing some fresh water flowing in, in the river. Israel has committed to over 30 million cubic meters to be released into the river. Today, we're only seeing 9 million cubic meters, which is a very small amount, but it's a wonderful start, and we're happy with it. And we will continue to work until we can see another 200 million cubic meters flowing into the river to achieve partial rehabilitation. I said that it's only sewage and saline water that's uh, keeping the Jordan River alive. But because of our work, because of including the residents of the communities, our residents were able to put pressure on their respective authorities, their municipalities, to stop the pollution, to stop the sewage from running into the Jordan River. So we were able to uh, um, um, ad advocate for building a sewage treatment plant on the Israeli side, on the Jordanian side, but also on the Palestinian side. The Jordan Jordanian government, who before we started working on the river, did not want, ha did not want anything to do with the river because it's a border area. Now we have the Jordan River placed on the national agenda of Jordan to be working with their Israeli counterparts 
towards the rehabilitation of the Jordan River. We produced the first ever master plan, regional master plan, that identifies projects to reach sustainable development in the Jordan River Valley. And we'll continue working on achieving so much more for our people in the region. We're here in the US as part of a mission to shed light on a very important uh, water crisis that we are facing, the Gaza water issues. But with this, I'll give the floor to Gidon to talk about the water crisis. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Yana. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, Sherry. I'm always delighted to be back here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And I'm afraid I'm going to go a little bit more bleak um, with the situation in Gaza, where two million people have run out of water. And two million people have run out of water because they've had no other choice but to over uh, mine their groundwater. So we can see that the groundwater is part of the coastal aquifer shared, as Yana mentioned, between Israel and Gaza. Um, we're over several decades and uh, uh, people have had to pump four times the renewable rate of that aquifer so that uh, as the aquifer has been falling and we're right on the Mediterranean, seawater is flowing in. Salinity levels can be over a thousand times higher than World Health Organization standards would permit for drinking purposes. Um, as we know, there's been an electricity crisis, there's an energy crisis, and there's been a lack of investment um, in sanitation in Gaza. And therefore, there is still no modern sewage treatment plant, although the World Bank is about to complete one, um, and, and we'll come to that in a minute. And therefore, sewage is also seeping into that same aquifer, and you can see that in the nitrate levels uh, uh, in the aquifer. Um, by the end of this year, the best estimates are that 100% of that groundwater will no longer be potable, and people should not be drinking it. It doesn't mean that they're not drinking it, because what other alternatives do they have? Um, in the work of, uh, of, of Ecopeace, um, we've really uh, tried to think uh, heavily on, well, how do we help turn things around? Because Gaza is clearly a ticking time bomb. Um, when, we when we talk about the threats of uh, water security leading to national insecurity, then Gaza is indeed a case study that we all need to be thinking about, um, to learn from and to avoid uh, from uh, further development and avoid from happening in other parts of the region, the West Bank, Jordan, other parts of, of the Middle East. Um, and when we looked at at the issues, we thought that's okay. Um, we thought that uh, 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 we need to look at it from a perspective of how can we influence the self-interest of all sides to turn things around. And uh, uh, we thought deeply, and, and, and we uh, uh, actually went out and uh, tried to find cholera on Israeli beaches just north of Gaza, because we thought that if the cholera uh, 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 disease, if the cholera uh, uh, bacteria was to be found across the border, that would lead to action. Now, we didn't find cholera, thank goodness. But while uh, 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 coming back from uh, the tests, uh, we heard that the Ashkelon desalination plant just north of Gaza was closed. And that was not public knowledge. And we started asking more questions. And in the end, we put in a freedom of information request. And we got information that, in fact, from the sewage that, that leaves Gaza, and you can see a little bit of the sewage there, uh, 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 the sewage flows upstream uh, to Israel and is responsible for closing beaches, not only in Gaza, but in Israel, closing uh, uh, the desalination plant at Ashkelon several times. Uh, why is this important? Because um, uh, we always knew that you can't disengage from a shared environment. But nature has proven to us that we can't disengage, that this is of 
mutual interest. Um, and by releasing that information, this is satellite imagery that very few people have seen. This was also uh, received through a Freedom of Information request. And we literally see the movement, the red, this is an infrared satellite imagery um, coming uh, out of a university in Tel Aviv, um, uh, showing the movement of the sewage in Gaza and continuing to move uh, up the Israeli coast all the way, uh, in fact, to Ashkelon. Um, uh, what this information led was to a change in policies because uh, what we saw was that the mayors on uh, all sides of the Gaza Strip have lots of reasons for concern, be they Palestinian or be they Israeli. And the letter uh, uh, in Hebrew here at the top is a letter of all the mayors on the Israeli side of Gaza um, expressing concern to the Israeli Prime Minister and to the Israeli Minister of Defense that we're at the front line, that uh, we... Uh, the residents on the Israeli side who have suffered terribly from Hamas rockets, from tunnel attacks, don't want to be on the front line should cholera break out in Gaza because cholera will not stop on the Gaza side of the border. It clearly will be carried with the raw sewage. And this is raw sewage on the, on the top photo here flowing today from Gaza in Wadi Hanun uh, uh, to the Israeli side. Uh, 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 wells on the Israeli side have been closed because of the sewage uh, in Gaza. Now, we can play the blame game, and Hamas have a lot to account for, um, but that is not enough. And therefore, the change in policies that uh, we requested and the mayors on the Israeli side requested was a change in policy of recognizing that we can't disengage. So that the policy before this information was released, and it really shows the strength of the Good Water Neighbors Project. The policy before, and it was led by Sylvan Shalom, uh, a former minister in Israel, was that, you know, if we in Israel get rockets from Hamas, we're not going to send or sell additional water, and we're not going to sell additional electricity. And from an emotional perspective, I too run to my shelter when rockets come uh, from Hamas to Tel Aviv, and you can, you can have an emotional understanding, but that's not the leadership that we need. And uh, with the release of this information, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, uh, the new Minister uh, um, of Water and Energy, um, uh, gosh, his name suddenly escaped me. Steinitz. Yuval Steinitz actually changed policies and came and identified, and this really speaks to Sherry's work, Sherry's comments, that they identify that this is a national security issue. This is not, not just an environmental uh, concern. This is not an issue uh, of humanitarian concern only to Gaza, but this is a national security issue also for Israel. And with that understanding, policies changed overnight. And Israel today is at the forefront of trying to get more water into Gaza and more electricity into Gaza and wants to see in fact, um, much because of the change in understanding here, uh, the amount of water that uh, Israel started to sell to Gaza was doubled from 5 to 10 million cubic meters. A recent agreement really to the credit. And here you see again uh, uh, the U.S. special envoy to uh, the peace process, uh, um, uh, Jason Greenblatt, uh, together with one of the mayors. He just explained to him why um, uh, uh, policies need to be changed and an agreement is reached with the Palestinian Minister of Water the Israeli Minister of Regional Cooperation um, in the framework of the Red Dead but most critically to supply an additional 10 million cubic meters of water to Gaza and 23 million cubic meters of water to the West Bank so that change can take place and that's, that, that's an, another important uh, a point to take home, as again, as Sherry said, that if we frame the conversation in a way that does speak to uh, self-interest, but in a manner that advances mutual gain, we do see the parties come together. And we do see uh, an understanding of 
real mutual risk um, uh, should we fail uh, and, uh, and not to move forward. And, and I, I think the real fear here, and this gentleman um, uh, in the middle from the Israeli military, uh, Poli Mordechai, uh, he is the head of COGAT. He's the uh, chief military person that uh, liaisons with the Palestinian Authority. He's extremely outspoken on the water and sanitation crisis facing Gaza because he well understands that should cholera break out in Gaza tomorrow, because it could break out in Gaza tomorrow, people are drinking unhealthy water. The 10 million cubic meters currently coming in from Israel is not enough. The domestic water consumption is around 50 million cubic meters of water. Um, uh, and, and therefore, uh, he's vocal because he's, uh, he well understands that should cholera break out tomorrow in Gaza, there'll be hundreds of thousands of people walking to the fence with Israel and with Egypt. And they won't be carrying rockets and they won't be carrying stones. They'll be carrying empty buckets because they will not be able to trust the unhealthy water that's there. And they'll have to move. And no military, no military wants to meet hundreds of thousands of innocent people pleading for water. Um, so um, uh, that is a, a bleak pic a picture, even though we do see some progress. But climate change makes the picture even worse. So this is, I'm sorry, this is in Hebrew. It's coming uh, from uh, uh, the Israeli uh, Water Authority. But it shows how we've underestimated climate change for our region. So we were talking about, the models were telling us there's going to be a 20% decline in precipitation. Well, what we see on the ground is a 30% decline in precipitation. And the Sea of Galilee, which is what this graph uh, is about, is, the, is at the lowest levels uh, in recorded history. So what we see um, uh, uh, is, uh, if we look over you know, the, the last uh, 100 odd, odd years, in the last 15 years, we no longer see uh, a regular uh, good drought, a good regular good rain, high rainfall periods. We see only one in the last 15 years, one good rainfall year. And we see much deeper, longer drought periods. We don't see that only in Israel. We also see that in Jordan. This is from Stanford University, um, uh, who have the, the Jordan Project. And similarly, while in the past we saw drought periods, but good rainy periods thereafter, again, last decade, consecutive years of drought with very little uh, uh, rainy periods. And of course, that's the same um, uh, for Palestine as well. Um, today, we are overdrawing our shared water resources by over 250 million cubic meters every year. We're not taking the water of our grandchildren. We're taking the water of our children. Um, by uh, 2030, just on current domestic needs, we're going to be close to 600 million cubic meters of, uh, of, of, of missing water. Um, so that if we don't respond, what we see in Gaza today, perhaps what we saw out of Syria, uh, 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 and the uprising in Syria and the, and the relationship of uh, the failure to respond to drought there, uh, indeed repeating yes. itself throughout the Middle East. So um, it's a warning, and, and, and we must heed the warning. Yet we are able to respond, and we can respond through uh, leadership in the water sector. And, and at this time, Israel is a world leader in the sector, um, both on the treating of wastewater... 86% um, uh, of the wastewater is treated and reused, and desalination, where uh, uh, Israeli-American cooperation has led to membrane technology development that has dropped the price of desalination from $2 a cubic meter to $0.50 cents a cubic meter. That makes it more viable than uh, 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 drawing water from deep wells. Um, the combination, of course, of uh, of treating wastewater and desalination is almost doubling your, your uh, water economy. Because if you can produce an additional cubic meter of desalinated water, and then you can 
uh, that becomes sewerage and then you treat it and you reuse it, you increase your water economy not by one, but by 1.8%. Uh, um, uh, when, uh, when Israel is thinking about uh, its uh, 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 water security, um, it's planning big. And uh, at the moment, um, again, this is coming from the Israeli Water Authority, um, Israel is desalinating some close to 600 million cubic meters of water. But by 2050, um, uh, in, or in order to overcome what it now very clearly sees, so that in Israel, uh, in the region, uh, Jordan and Palestine, the Palestinian Water Authority, all our water authorities have absolutely no doubt that climate change has hit our region. I know that, th that this is a controversial issue perhaps here, but it's not. There's no controversy. Whether you're right or left, whether you're pro-peace or anti-peace, everyone is fearful of uh, the implications of climate change. And um, the, the, at least the Water Authority doesn't mean the government of Israel will, will allow so much water to be produced, but the plans are to triple by 2050 the amount of, of desalination um, uh, 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 to meet um, Israeli needs only. Um, in that context, we believe at Equipeace and here we'll close so that we can also um, uh, uh, continue the conversation. Um, we believe that um, uh, through the development of a, uh, of a water energy uh, nexus, a water energy exchange, we can uh, uh, defeat uh, the concerns of uh, water and energy insecurity for our region. Now, when I come and say that, I don't mean that this is instead of a fair water deal, because that a fair water deal between Israelis and Palestinians needs to take place. In fact, we think that, that by increasing the pie, we make a fair water deal, which is uh, uh, a, a, a fair allocation of natural resources that are shared uh, unfairly at the moment. We think that that can happen uh, uh, when we continue to increase the pie, because then we have a situation of no uh, uh, losers. We can all be winners. Um, what we are proposing, and we just completed a two-year study with the support of the German government and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, is indeed that uh, uh, each side look at the comparative advantages that they have. And you know, Israel and Gaza really do, do have the comparative advantage of the Mediterranean coast. Gaza too plans to desalinate. It wants to build a 50 million cubic meter desalination plant. Uh, uh, it needs that plant urgently and it needs international support to make that happen. It wants to go further to over 100 million uh, desalination plant. I said to you already what Israel's planning. Um, the comparative advantage of Jordan is its vast uh, desert areas and some of the highest radiation levels on Earth um, where Jordan could produce uh, uh, green electricity through, fault, through photovoltaic uh, uh, electricity, energy. Um, and what our proposal is saying is that um, uh, Jordan, through private sector investment, this does not require uh, uh, donor assistance, but through private sector investment, uh, produce 20% of its own energy needs and therefore meet its own commitments to Paris and the Climate Accord, sell 20% uh, uh, of the needs of electricity in Israel. Um, so Jordan would sell. Uh, and that way, Israel meets its climate commitment of 17% renewables uh, under Paris. Uh, and uh, our study shows that that's the cheapest way for actually for Israel to meet its commitment. And sell electricity to Palestine and to, to Gaza so that, uh, again, they can utilize that uh, uh, energy for desalination. What um, uh, the end uh, result is that we really do have winners across the board. And through a water energy exchange, um, uh, Jordan has the revenue. Jordan becomes a net uh, uh, producer of energy with uh, uh, sufficient uh, uh, income to buy all the water it needs and, and more. And renewable energy becomes the single largest industry in Jordan. Uh, Palestine becomes a diversified water and energy source. So 
Uh, it's not just dependent on Israel. There's interdependencies in place at a regional level. And uh, overall, we see a situation, uh, instead of a situation of dependency, which is the current framework, we see interdependencies developing. This is not uh, unique to the Middle East. This concept of interdependency was developed by France and Germany after World War II, and that led to the coal and steel agreement, as coal and steel being the two most important natural resources of continental Europe. Well, we think that water and the sun and the energy that the sun can produce are the two most important natural resources of our part of the world. If we're to avoid the, uh, uh, the tragedy of Syria, the, the uh, uh, disaster that uh, uh, we uh, uh, could face in Gaza tomorrow and that could be extended uh, uh, to the West Bank, to, to Jordan, um, uh, to the rest of the Middle East, then adopting such policies of healthy interdependencies, and we believe uh, is a powerful way to promote regional water and energy stability as a foundation for uh, long-lasting uh, peace between our people. So thank you very much for that attention. Thank you very much, Gidon. Shira? Thank you, Sherry, <coughs> Robert, Yana, and Gidon. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be able to speak with you all today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my PhD dissertation research and our findings about water and conflict and cooperation and how that relates to the work of EcoPeace and conclude with some thoughts on, on challenges and, and opportunities for replicating the EcoPeace model in other parts of the world. So the Basins at Risk, or BAR project, looked at conflict and cooperation over water in international river basins. It was conducted at Oregon State University. The initial idea for the project was Aaron Wolfs, my professor, and I thought, all right, I'll do a, a small, I'll do a pilot study. I'll look at two basins over 20 years, see if the methodology works. But Aaron got funding from the National Science Foundation, and it became all the world's international river basins, all the time 265, <laughs> over a period of 50 years. It was published in 2002, but the findings are still relevant today. It was a global scale quantitative exploration of the relationship between fresh water and conflict. It was essentially asking, do all the, the theories at the time about water's link to war hold true? Our aim was to see if we could identify historical indicators of conflict or cooperation and evaluate river basins at potential risk for future conflict. So we created a database of water events, incidents of conflict or cooperation over water. We assigned a numerical score to each event that designated the intensity of the conflict or cooperation and we tested these events against more than 80 biophysical, socioeconomic, and political variables. And we used a geographic information system, a GIS, so we could look at these things at the basin scale or at the other geographic scales. Our interest was on instances of conflict and cooperation between nations that occur within an international river basin that involves the countries that share that basin and that concern water as a consumable resource or as a quantity to be managed. So for example, we excluded instances where water was used as a weapon or where the issues were really about boundary disputes, navigation, fishing, territory, and the like. We found that out of 1,800 events, the vast majority were cooperative. And more than half the events represented verbal interactions. So a lot of it was people saying very nice or very not nice things to each other about water. There were only 21 events that represented, that were in our most uh, conflictive category. These were extensive military acts. And not surprisingly, these were in the Aral, 
Jordan, Nile, and Tigris, Euphrates, all basins that were negotiating conflicts over the period of the data. And the data was from 1948 to 1999. So as I talk, keep that in mind that this is not recent data. It ends at 1999 for this particular study. So the bulk of uh, those uh, 21 military acts were in the Jordan Basin. And it it's, has not historically been an easy place to work on water cooperation, but it is perhaps also more the exception than the rule. In many places, technical cooperation over water can be a stepping stone to building international cooperation on more difficult political issues. And as we've heard this morning, even in the Jordan River Basin, there is progress on water cooperation through the efforts of organizations such as EcoPeace. In the BAR project, we also found that a lot of the most commonly cited indicators linking freshwater and international conflict were not supported by the data. Neither climate, water stress, government type, relative power, dams, nor dependence on water for agriculture or energy needs showed a significant association with conflict over freshwater resources. What we did find was that conflict was associated, that intense conflict was associated with rapid or, extre or extreme changes in the institutional or physical systems in a river basin, such as internationalization of a basin or the unilateral building of a large dam. And where also there was a lack of institutional mechanisms to mitigate that conflict, in particular freshwater treaties. So in other words, the likelihood and intensity of dispute rises as the rate of change within a basin exceeds the institutional capacity to absorb that change. So institutions and institutional infrastructure matter in mediating the potential escalation of conflict. And the majority of conflictive events in the data set were largely about quantity and to a smaller extent infrastructure. The cooperative events, on the other hand, covered a wide range of issues, economic development, joint management, quality, quantity, hydropower, flood control. Now, the BAR project was examining conflict at the international level. As you move down the scale to more local levels, the findings shift. The likelihood for violent conflict over water is more likely at smaller geographic scales especially where there are not institutions in place to mitigate that conflict. So a focus on building institutional and technical capacity for managing and monitoring water resources at local scales is especially important. Now, while water can exacerbate international conflict, it's usually between states that have negative relations overall. And there are cases when states in military conflict over other issues, still quietly supported their river basin commissions or maintained water sharing arrangements. So for example, India and Pakistan, even when they were firing shots at each other, still quietly funded and provided data to the Indus River Basin Commission. And there are other examples around the world. So water issues can serve as a strong bridge to peace and security. So one of the areas I work in is forest landscape restoration. I'm with the U.S. Forest Service, and it's one of the more fun things I get to do. And there's increased global interest in uh, forest and ecosystem restoration. There's a bond challenge, which is a, a global goal to restore 150 million hectares of lost or degraded forest land by 2020 and 300 million hectares by 2030. And this past March, Nine Mediterranean countries, including Iran, Lebanon, and Turkey, adopted the Agadir commitment, which is a pledge to restore 8 million hectares of degraded lands in the region. So in many countries, there's increasing recognition of the importance of ecosystems for addressing water and other environmental and societal needs. But for watershed restoration work to be successful and sustainable over time, you have to engage local communities. In the U.S. Forest Service, in our work on forest and watershed restoration, we've learned that partnerships and collaboration are key, especially when there's a lot of existing conflict over issues. So we need to promote community involvement and participation, 
in planning, in implementation, in monitoring outcomes. And when you bring together a diverse perspectives and ins ensure that your organizational approach allows all the stakeholders to have a voice, it helps develop a shared vision. And this shared vision, in turn, helps ensure that there's long-term support for the project and its outcomes, and that ecological, economic, and social needs are addressed effectively. It takes time to build that trust and develop effective collaboration. And it takes leadership, and it takes shared access to scientific information and data and education. And these are the same lessons that are part of EcoPeace's approach. Another finding in the Basins at Risk project was that almost all the conflict occurred between pairs of countries, whereas cooperation was most likely between larger groups of countries. So taking an approach that engages multiple stakeholders at different levels of governance may have an advantage in finding areas of common ground. And those small goal, working on those small goals and activities upon which trust is built. And it also requires a lot of time and effort to gain that broader engagement. So EcoPeace's approach to building capacity and engaging and educating decision makers at all levels who can help with that effort is, is important. So I'm going to stop here in the interest of allowing lots of time for questions. But I'm really looking forward to following the progress of Eco, the EcoPeace program on water and security as it moves forward. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shira. I think um, collectively some excellent framing uh, for us. So I, I wanted to ask all of you, as we sit here in, in Washington, D.C., you know, part of the mission of the Wilson Center is to bring these issues to the U.S. public and to engage in a conversation and dialogue as to why this is important. Why does this approach to peace building around water, hydro diplomacy, engagement at various levels. Why is this important for us now, globally? And specifically, why is this work in the region important for us in the United States? Um, so would you like to start? Yes, thank you, Roger. Very important question. And uh, the reason why we're here in the US to uh, talk about our work, to present our work, um, I would just like to take a um, um, focus on our work on the Jordan River, um, um, specifically talking about the communities on the Jordanian side and the Palestinian side of the Jordan River. We're dealing with poverties of uh, uh, pockets of poverty. Um, all the communities um, are very poor communities, which leads to building of uh, uh, radical thinking among the people because they don't have um, um, uh, proper livelihoods. They don't have uh, um, economic prosperity in any way. So on the Jordanian side, focusing mainly on the Jordanian side, 40%, there's a rate of 40% of unemployment, especially among youth. A lot of the people that have joined ISIS are from, from, the jo uh, from Jordan, are from the Jordan Valley. So by talking about economic development, by talking about s reaching sustainable development for those communities, especially in relation to water projects, sanitation projects, which are a basic human need, identifying better livelihoods for these people is very important to build on uh, uh, those people having better livelihoods. Um, and I think this is um, in, uh, not only a US interest, but a global interest to, f to defeat terrorism in that manner. So Jan, I was, I was very glad to hear you um talk about this in your response, because during your, your intervention earlier, you specifically mentioned youth engagement. Talk a little bit more about how you're directly engaging young people. What are they getting out of it? I mean, you make the link to livelihoods, um, unemployment. Give, could you tell a story or two 
Give us some very concrete, specific examples of how you're engaging young people. And is this primarily young men? Are you also able to engage young women? So uh, um, we focus on gender equality. So we engage with both boys and girls. Um, we, are, we want to empower women as women leaders, um, especially on the Jordanian and Palestinian sides. But that doesn't mean that we don't include all, all sectors, um, gender equality, boys and girls, in all the programs. The way we do it with youth is that we, um, we create two groups of youth water trustees due to the sensitivity sometimes that on the Jordanian side and Palestinian side, you don't find many mixed schools. So we'd have to put together a group of boys schools and then another group of girls schools. We bring them on a national level, first of all, to understand their water realities. A lot of people, a lot of children in, uh, in our schools don't understand where the water is coming from, how to conserve this water. Uh, uh, how to deal with the issues of pollution, with the environmental uh, problems that they face in their communities. So we empower them with this. We take them on field trips. We have them engage with authorities, with their municipalities, for them to understand all these challenges they are facing, but more to propose solutions. And they go to their decision makers, put pressure on their decision makers, requesting that this must change on ground. This definitely prepares them to sit with their counterparts in the other countries. Because when we, before we start educating the youth, it, they're just, each side sees the other as the enemy. Not understanding that we need to really cooperate, be there together, uh, uh, working together, especially over shared waters. We prepare them. We build that stepping stone for them. And then we bring them together on a regional level to talk, to engage <coughs> in relation to their water realities. So for instance, um, Israeli children are always shocked by the fact that Jordanian and Palestinian children don't receive water 24 hours a day. to hear about each other's problems and identify solutions together. And this really builds the trust between them and has them um, engaged even further after we finish with them, uh, our work with them. And, and you call them youth water trustees. Yes. I like that. <laughs> Get on. So, so I, I first I want to say that I think if there were more... Uh, uh, women engineers, if there were more women mayors, if there were more women ministers, we wouldn't be in the water and sanitation crisis that we are globally. <laughs> Thank you for that. Because, because I think um, uh, uh, the cost is not gender equivalent. Women pay a much higher price, and they're not there making the decisions. It's men overwhelmingly, and we see it in our region too. Um, I think that um, uh, uh, the the crisis, the refugee crisis that we saw in these last uh, years from Syria, but not only from Syria, in in parts of Africa as well, are, cl are related to water and, and are related to the failure to manage water. So um, uh, we have an urgency uh, to educate ourselves better, um, to uh, uh, influence and change policies so that uh, the climate refugees, the water refugees, do not become an even larger phenomena than it is today. Um, and that must be of global concern. It must be of US concern. Now, um, I I today, there's a, there's a markup taking place on, in the Congress on the Taylor Force Act. Now, it's not clear uh, where water stands. So there's a, an exception that's been made on wastewater, and we're grateful for that. But it's not clear to us. USAID wants to invest in the building of reservoirs in Gaza. And it's not clear to us whether, should that uh, legislation be passed, 
whether the USAID will be allowed to invest in reservoirs to receive water from Israel in order to blend it with groundwater from Gaza and make more water available for two million people. Uh, now, the fact that it's not clear whether that will be allowed sho it shows that we don't understand deeply enough what we're doing. Um, uh, so so it, uh, I, I really do want to bring it home you know, to a U.S. audience that we need to think more deeply about you know, the, the consequences of decisions taken. And uh, whatever we think of, of the Taylor Force Act, no one wants to see water stop flowing into Gaza. Uh, I, th I think we can all agree on that, um, uh, whether we're Israeli, Palestinian, Republican, or Democrat. Um, uh, and, 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 and therefore, we need to th be thinking more deeply when, we, uh, uh, when decisions are made, what will be the unintended consequences? And will we actually be shooting ourselves in the foot? Um, so that was uh, uh, bring it really right home to, the, to an American audience. Great. Thank you very much. You were one of the things that, that you um, specifically mentioned. You talk about the importance of this, this eco-peace model, how it leads to building trust. You say that it takes time, that it's important to have leadership by example. We must have shared access to data and information. Cooperation among larger groupings is, is particularly useful. How do we take that model and make the case that this is in our interest, to look at these kinds of models that lead to greater stability, greater peace. You know, um, Gadan mentioned that it's not just a humanitarian, it's not just a, a development issue. It really gets to be a national security issue. How do we talk about these models and present them in a way so that it's a national security issue for us in the United States? Well, I. I think that uh, what Sherry spoke to, how the national security community in the United States are already recognizes that water, if it's not addressed, is a, s a national security threat. And when you add climate change as an exacerbating factor into that, that makes it even more important. And then, as Yana mentioned, if you have a lot of people, particularly young people, and they don't have, because of lack of access to clean, fresh water, sanitation. It's, there's a lot of poverty, there aren't jobs, there aren't other opportunities, or maybe there's a, a flood or a drought or another disaster, and if there's not a strong national government that's coming in to provide assistance to these communities, but there are groups that may represent radical or terrorist views that come in and provide that assistance, um, they recruit these people. And so if the U.S. has a concern about increase in terrorism, then addressing these issues at the root level such that people have other choices and other options about what they choose to do and that there is good institutional capacity in governments and governance so that you can meet basic needs. I mean, beyond the, the just the basic humanitarian reasons for doing this, and the economic reasons that countries that have um, good economic development make good trading partners, and countries that are incredibly poor do not. Um, there's also then thinking about how if you have water crises within a country and that contributes to instability and a national government, it's, it's beyond a national government's capability to respond, um, what happens to that national government? Do other, do other groups take over? Is this a national government that has access, or a country that has nuclear weapons? What does that mean if you're creating instability in a region where there's also these military capabilities? And so there's domino effects that come in. I think the argument is not actually a, a difficult argument to make. What is hard is that the approach is not, well, we're going to build this big dam or infrastructure and that will fix the problem, because a lot of it is about changing people's behavior, communities on the ground. It's about leadership more than sort of the technical solutions to a problem. Yeah. And, and that takes, that it, it's, a, it's a fuzzier problem to yeah. get at, and that's harder when you are 
maybe a big international funding institution that wants to have like one big project to manage and not 20 smaller projects. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm glad that, that you highlight that because in our work under our Resilience to Peace project, you know, we talk about this social capital and how that is important to building uh, peaceful resilience over time. Let's open it up. Um, <laughs> wow, hands went up immediately. I love it. So my colleagues will come to you with a microphone. Please give your name and affiliation and get quickly to your comment or question so we can take a few of them at the, at, at the time. So let's start at this side of, your, uh, of the room. We we'll start with the gentleman here and then we'll come up to you. Good morning, my name is Tom Getman and I was an uh, NGO executive in the Middle East uh, working on and off here and there for over 25 years. And I wanna thank Yana and Gidon for the wonderful briefings we got from your folks on a trip with 28 people last month. Very, very helpful, especially in the Jordan River Valley. Um, a couple things just to sharpen the discussion a bit, please. Um, I, I really appreciate your vision and the way you're moving toward it and seeing people on the ground that have embraced it. There are things, though, that are holding it back, and I'm wondering if they're not undermining it, particularly the question of settlements that are pumping water out of Palestine and uh, getting 100% of the water need for settlers while people just below in the valley, like in Wadi Fokin, where we both work, uh, get only 40% and their springs are running dry. And the question of sewage going into the, the, the aquifers, but also into the Palestinian sewage disposal plants and overflowing because the settlements uh, don't have their own. It, it's managed in a difficult way. I'm also wondering if the bombing of the sewage disposal plant in Gaza has led to some partnership in helping to rebuild it because when we were there, that was running pretty effectively. And has the water pumping stopped out of Gaza for irrigation purposes in, the, um, in the southern Israel? So thanks for those clarifications, and keep up the good work and count on the NGOs and the UN partners to help. Great, thank you. Let's uh, come up here to the front of the room. Thank you. Um, Marina Janice Ecopis. I'm here in Washington, D.C., uh, working on our uh, program for water security, where we're taking the, the model from the Middle East and applying it to other regions and helping NGOs around the world, uh, creating the same kind of capacity. And I wanted just to address your question in regards to the instability and so on, because what I'm finding as I'm reaching out to NGOs is that a lot of NGOs, and these are also uh, NGOs that are working on more the s setting up these uh, facilities, uh, the, the sewage treatment plants, the, the networks, and so on. But what they realize is that they need people, they need the community around to really create the stability for these uh, types of installations to really uh, stay in function and, and work in, in the long term. And that's why they're also reaching out to Ecopeace to create that grassroots efforts. So thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, yes, let's take some more questions at the back of the room. Yes, we saw the gentleman in the middle. Thank you, Roger. Uh, my name is Finn, Finn Torgrimson, Longinotto. I'm also on the, one of the best things I do is on the International Advisory Committee of Ecopeace. Uh, looking at many NGOs with great research, uh, translating what they say has to be done into action has always been a problem. Uh, Ecopeace has been able to take uh, challenges and turn them into opportunities, and it was very clear I in Israel. Uh, from a top down, I'm wondering, you've described very well what's happening in Israel, but I find that easier to understand, not to simplify, oversimplify. We want to increase the uh, water sales to Gaza. What are the immediate challenges in Palestine and Jordan uh, that are similar that we can tackle from a top-down approach and how do we expect to go about that politically to get the political will <laughs> to do what needs to be done. Okay, great, thank you. We'll take one more for now. I think the gentleman at the uh, back of the room. 
I'm Ned Lazarus, George Washington University, uh, and uh, I think I'm joining in the previous question, but just ask specifically, uh, uh, not to bring up a sore point, but I'm just curious. I, I know that uh, relations between the Israeli and Jordanian governments have become strained since the uh, summer, and I wonder how that is uh, affecting progress on the agreements that were signed last year, the, br the breakthrough agreements that were signed last year. Thank you. Okay, great. Let's just deal with those set of questions. So, um, Israeli-Jordanian strained relations, what does that mean for now? What are some of the immediate uh, challenges that you're facing at the Palestine and Jordan side? And are there opportunities to look at top-down approaches in that context? Do you have any additional comments about how communities help to build long-term stability of institutions on the ground when you're doing the institution building? And what about settlements and sewage? Any thoughts? thoughts or reactions uh, to that. Uh, Shira, I don't know if you have any thoughts, comments, reactions. I mean, a lot of these are for these two, but let's start with you in case you want to add anything or say anything or ask anything building on those questions. Uh, I think they were a great set of questions and, and I'm particularly interested in um, the opportunities that you see in these challenges. Great, thank you. Gidon? So uh, l let, me, let me start with the um, uh, with the settlement question, um, the the war uh, our water and uh, sanitation issues are not settlement issues. Uh, our issues are the failure to reach a final agreement on water. So although uh, uh, the issue of settlements is sort of in your face, so you have a Palestinian community that gets you know so if you're in Yatta, you get water once every six weeks in summertime. Um, uh, if you're in if you're in Bethlehem in summertime, you get water once a month from the municipality, and the settlements around uh, Bethlehem get water 24/7. But that's because they are completely linked to the Israeli water network, um, and it's not necessarily the case that they're taking the water uh, directly from uh, the shared spring. Uh, so Jerusalem, uh, the, the 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 settlement blocks are connected to Israel proper. I think that the issue, I, th I think we mislead ourselves by uh, uh, linking uh, the settlement issue to the solving the water issue. I think the failure to solve water is very much a, uh, the linkage of water to the other final status issues of the peace process. Um, a wrong decision was made in 1995 and has been, uh, we believe, led in the negotiations ever since that either we agree on everything we agree on nothing. Um, because we can't agree on everything, we haven't been able to, we've agreed on nothing. And therefore, in that sense, water is being held hostage to the failure to agree on Jerusalem and refugees and borders and settlements. But water, uh, the water reality of 1994, 95, when we only had natural water uh, to share, is not the reality today where we have manufactured water that can supplement the natural water and replace uh, uh, the natural water as it's more fairly shared. And there's no question that Palestinians need to receive a fair share of the groundwater under their feet. Um, uh, uh, but that is only going to be achieved when we change the mindset of our respective governments on both sides who to this uh, day continue to a lead an all or nothing approach, and much of the international community. Um, perhaps we're actually seeing it with, with Jason Greenblatt, where, where, where we see a, 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 a real determination to move forward on water and sanitation. And, and, and that, that does, you know, th the Trump administration has, has come and said, we want to do everything differently, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, but um, doing, it, doing it differently in the Israeli-Palestinian context of, of, uh, uh, of not uh, uh, insisting on achieving everything or achieving nothing, we think is a good, uh, would be a good new approach um, because water, coming to Shira's comment, um, is solvable and the sanitation issues are completely solvable um, uh, if we can uh, uh, perhaps uh, lead forward on water first. So we have been leading a water cannot wait or a water first campaign over the last several years where we, s where we do see more and more buy-in 
um, uh, uh, in that approach. So I, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there for that question. Um, so I, I want to talk about some of the uh, challenges we face on the Jordanian-Palestinian level, um, um, especially with the top-down uh, dealing with our respective governments. Um, it, it's very challenging since we already have a, a, a severe water shortage. Um, so for instance, in Jordan, uh, the government is struggling to deal with the two million Syrian refugees that we received in Jordan. So it's, um, uh, and Gidon described uh, in one of the um, tables that he showed that Jordan alone now is facing a deficit of over 200 million cubic meters of water to meet our demands. Um, so creating that political will is a challenge for us in Palestine. But what we do and, um, through ECOPs is we highlight, even on the uh, to our respective governments, the benefits uh, um, of cooperation. So for instance, the water energy nexus, creating that political will is there because we, um, st since we started working on uh, the pre-feasibility study for a water energy nexus, we included our governments from the start. We had them come to our different round tables and we have them uh, look at the research and comment, uh, uh, giving them the opportunity to take ownership um, of the research as well. We identified decision makers from Israel, Palestine. We're planning on a trip to, uh, uh, to both Brussels and Berlin at the end of this month. And uh, we're going to take uh, um, government uh, officials on that trip to further fundraise for a feasibility study for a water energy nexus, because it's the only way forward for us in the region. Unfortunately, this brings us to the question of um, the political tension between Israel and Palestine now. It's Jordan. very, between <laughs> Israel and Jordan. Uh, we're not used to that, um, that there's a, um, that tension between Jordan and Israel, and we don't wanna see this happening. Unfortunately, it's the case now. Um, there is that tension on ground, and it's very challenging for us at Ecopeace um, on all levels. So for the Jordanian delegation that was due to um, go to Brussels and Berlin with us, um, it's been, um, they had to apologize from attending. And this is a setback in every way, even internally for us at Ecopeace. I mean, I'm used to having a visa to Israel all the time. I don't have a visa. I can't go to our Tel Aviv office and work out of there since I'm um, leading on all projects as well. So um, many challenges for us, and we don't want to see such tensions continue. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, I want to add to that that um, uh, we can't afford uh, uh, that uh, tension to continue and there's a need for a, a third party mediator get to get involved um, uh, to uh, uh, you know, correct that, that relationship again because that has been the relationship that's been at the foundation of peacemaking in a broader uh, uh, vision for the region um, and you know, so I think US interests here are critical um, that uh, that relationship is is repaired again, and uh, you know again from a, a water security perspective, if my uh, uh, neighbor's uh, water insecurity is my national security, then the case of Jordan is really uh, at point. Jordan is the longest border with Israel. Um, uh, a poor relationship between Israel and Jordan threatens uh, the ability to overcome the water insecurities that Jordan faces. And that cannot be in Israel's national interest. So uh, both sides need to correct what we think has been uh, some poor leadership um, uh, that has uh, led to uh, uh, where we are today. Thank you. Let's take some more questions. Yes, let's start with the gentleman at the back. Uh, very good morning. My name is Michael Gordon. Um, I'm a fellow here at the Wilson Center. Uh, two questions. One, uh, Yala mentioned um, on the refugee issue in Jordan, 
uh, even before the Syrian refugee crisis, Jordan is one of the poorest uh, uh, water countries in the world. And I wonder, <coughs> what is your thought of the long-term impact on water resources in Jordan if they were already struggling to meet uh, daily demand? What does this mean for literally increasing Jordan's population by 10 to 15 percent in just a couple of years? Um, and then the second question is um, it's sort of a chicken and egg question on economic development. Um, when you look at booming cities in the Middle East, you know, the Abu Dhabis and Dubais are extraordinarily water intensive. And it's really hard to imagine that level of economic development in the Levant uh, given a shortage of water. So how, how do you see sort of economic development and the lack of water resources playing on each other? And thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Gamal. I'm non-affiliate. Uh, my uh, what, what what you guys were what you guys educate us your experience the work that you guys are doing showed me today that uh, changed my mind actually uh, from. Ch changed me from the idea of uh, to I, I I was two state solutionist I, I I'm 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 not I'm not from uh, Palestine I'm from Egypt but I always w I always thought that we for 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 those people who wanted to give the Palestinian land and give them and, and give them their own state we're gonna help the Palestinian and stuff like that I was I was from that side of the equation but what what you guys showed today uh, sh changed me and made me think that. Uh, the, the best solution is one state. The best, sta uh, the, the best solution is that uh, the state of Israel adopt the, their, their small Palestinian neighbor uh, and, 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 and manage, manage their, sewage uh, their sewage system, help them with their water, uh, uh, connect the grid with them. W why, why, why the state of Israel have to sell water, to have to sell uh, Water to the state and electricity to the state of Palestine or whatever Gaza or why can't you just just, just if, even 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 uh, even the judiciary if 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 if, if, we, if we have two state if, if we have one small uh, Palestinian state we will end up having almost another Lebanon we don't want it to have another Lebanon actually it will then then the, then the Palestinian state will become two Lebanon actually so. Uh, I believe, m m m in, in, in my opinion, with, with, with you guys' help, if you guys stretch your muscle a little bit and become politician and become leaders, uh, probably you will... <laughs> well, you can't. You br 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 probably you will, you will, you, you will overcome the, the, those uh, two-state solutionists in the state of Israel and embrace your uh, neighbor, Palestinian. Uh, and, and then the Egyptian, on the other hand, we will love you guys, and we will... So, so, so my, 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 question, my question to you guys, are you, uh, there's three of you, are you one state solutionist, two state solutionists? Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's come up with gentleman here. Good morning. My name is uh, Josh Maxwell. I work for a uh, overseas strategic consulting, which is a small business that does USAID work. Additionally, I am a mayor of a small town in Pennsylvania and s vice chair of our local water authority board. Uh, so uh, very interesting conversation for me, taking lots of notes. So my question is specifically about your Good Water Neighbors program. I'm interested to find out what community mobilization, uh, what political barriers there were on the local level, and also what community mobilization tools uh, were most successful in overcoming those barriers. Great, thank you. Yes? Thank you. Uh, Laura Aleme with Safadi Foundation. Um, I, I'd like to try and help you stretch your muscle. <laughs> <laughs> and um, a few weeks ago, Vice P President Pence announced that he was going to be, that the U.S. government was going to be taking funding directly to faith-based initiatives. And I'm wondering, giving, given the symbolism of the Jordan River, <laughs> if um, you guys have thought about, or maybe you're already doing, reaching out to some of the evangelical organizations. I think here in Washington, that could be a very effective political strategy and also for future donors as well for, for projects. And then very quickly, is there anything left over from the Middle East regional cooperative things that were happening during the Oslo process? And what role might you see for Lebanon um, should it not become the next Yemen? Thank you very much. 
Okay, great. And we'll take, let's yeah. deal with those and then we'll come to you. Um, so, um, uh, so looking at the long-term impact in Jordan with water resources uh, and population growth of the refugee population, um, question about economic development and the water intensity of economic development in the region. Uh, how is that going to play out? A challenge for you to stretch your muscle a little. Um, the best solution is one state. Do you agree? How do you engage? How do you react to that? Uh, mayor from a small town asking about what were some of the barriers, how you overcame the barriers, and what are the opportunities around community mobilization with this good water neighbor approach. Can you engage a faith-based uh, faith community and what's left over for the region coming out of the Oslo process? So let's start with you. Wow. Many very important questions that need a long time, but uh, I'll try to cover as much as I can. Um, so Michael, regarding your question about uh, um, um, the increase of population in Jordan and, and the demand, we've always faced, uh, um, as we talked about, uh, a water shortage. Um, we're um, uh, scarce in nature. Uh, in Jordan, but the government has always reacted to this by um, um, different projects on ground. What we're saying is that we're um, at EcoPeace uh, looking at the national water economy for Jordan. Uh, that many measures need to be ta uh, need to be taken into consideration, uh, especially do, uh, with the water reform that is needed in the country uh, for proper management. Um, um, so, for instance, in Jordan, we have over 50% uh, 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 of the water lost uh, um, uh, in conveyance. Um, a lot of that is uh, um, uh, water theft also. Um, I can't say, but the government is really um, taking these issues into consideration and dealing with them. Um, but this leaves us with no other solution but um, the cooperation with Israel. So um, we depend on the water we buy from Israel. And this is something, uh, this is the healthy interdependencies that we were talking about that we would like to see happen more and more. Um, so for the water energy nexus um, that we are proposing, moving, um, trying to move forward um, in the region, um, our only uh, uh, way forward is for Jordan to be buying water, um, the majority of the water from Israel. Um, for the faith base, yes. I mean, especially uh, um, uh, focusing on our work on the Jordan River, we thought about how we should include all different stakeholders. And yes, the uh, different congregations uh, um, uh, addressing issues of water and the Jordan importance of the Jordan River to the different religions uh, um, is something that we did focus on. So in 2011, we did uh, launch a campaign addressing uh, a faith-based campaign addressing all religions on the importance of the Jordan River and getting support of the different congregations to move forward. And we'd love to come over anytime we're required in the um, US, of course. Uh, we're always speaking at churches, um, synagogues, mosques um, about um, our faith-based campaign. Um, any other questions for me that I can address? Why don't you go ahead? And sure. I'll so, so um, the the one state, two state. So you you know, we have enough to do in in water, <laughs> <laughs> and we really do have our, our hands full already. But but uh, uh, you know, as an organization, we do believe in a two state solution. We think that the uh, political aspirations of Israelis and Palestinians to have uh, their own states are legitimate and need to be met. Um, beyond that, though. We think that when it comes to managing our water resources, well, we need to you know, really develop the type of cooperation that uh, you know, the Rhine River Commission has developed uh, in Europe, or the US-Canada International Joint Water uh, Commission, or the International Boundary Waters Commission between the US and Mexico. Um, so when it comes to the management of our water resources, we think that there needs to be a sophisticated level of inter state uh, cooperation um, that, that uh, and, and uh, you know, w w we're leaving here for a meeting at EPA uh, where uh, for over 20 years, EPA created, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, there's a presidential order to create a good neighbor environment board 
for American communities along the Mexican border. We're, want we're wanting to learn from that experience because that board of a good neighbor environment board brings together all of the states, it brings together all the federal agencies of the US, all of the relevant states, but no less importantly, all, all the relevant uh, municipalities and mayors, civil society groups, private sector, um, to have a much deeper cooperation uh, at the border level. Um, uh, so that's the, the level of cooperation. We want to see deep cooperation. And uh, you know, together with Egypt, we also we, we need to work together, and and, and uh, with Lebanon as well. You know, our our master plan for the Jordan Valley at the moment only uh, is looking at the lower part of the river, but it's all scalable, and of course, it must include Lebanon and Syria as two other riparians to the river if we're truly going to get things right. The water energy nexus that we're proposing. Well, you know, it doesn't need to stay just Israeli, Palestinian, Jordanian. In fact, it, it really uh, needs to, over time, expand and include Lebanon, which has the comparative advantage of the coast, and Syria, which has the comparative advantage of the desert hinterland, and Sinai, which has both, uh, you know, the coast and uh, uh, the the desert hinterland, and you know, perhaps. You know, using the model of the coal and steel agreement of, of Europe, you know, create a water and energy community for the Levant. Now, you know, will that lead to the European Union? Who knows? But, but will it create, and I think that's what um, Ashura was speaking about before, will that help create the type of institution that helps to uh, 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 you know, found and stabilize strong self-interest, economic interests that, that can help uh, balance uh, you know, the other emotional uh, type concerns that, that, that we suffer from uh, in our region. Um, so that you know, a water energy community um, uh, uh, and a broader one that, that and you know, there's interest in Lebanon today. We, we, you know, we can't be open about it, but there are government officials that are really keen to look at, uh, at these types of models and, 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 and be a part. Um, uh, also, also in Egypt, we, we, we know that um, there's strong interest um, uh, in, in these types of models. So um, the opportunities are there. Uh, uh, the political landscape of the Middle East is changing so fast that no one can even keep up with it. Um, we need to make sure that, that these issues get on the, the political table um, so that uh, decision makers are, are aware and, and, and through efforts such as here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, um, uh, this is a, a powerful way to get the information uh, uh, further understood. That we have opportunities, that, that we don't need to be um, uh, the depressed and uh, example of tragedy to the rest of the world. We can also be the example of prosperity um, uh, uh, through the type of interdependencies that we're, we're suggesting. So, get on. Talk talk a little bit more about that. Um, so, you you um, you have a specific question about how you rolled out this good water neighbors program, community engagement barriers. Give some of the mechanics of that. So, 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 I, I so you have a, a local mayor saying, "I want to yes, learn from yes. this example." So, 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 uh, I think um, a lot of it. Uh, our experience is that you know most. Uh, people that we see as leaders, they don't lead, they follow. Um, it's rare that you get a, you know, a King Hussein and, and an Itzhak Rabin that, that really lead, that really they're acting contrary to the majority or to the vocal uh, loud voices in their respective countries. Most uh, 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 you know, politicians, I've got nothing against politicians, but most politicians follow what uh, might get them back in. Um, so uh, what's been so important in the Good Water Neighbors program is to help build constituency to help uh, leaders lead. Um, so um, what we found really effective, starting with mayors, because they're also elected in, most, in many countries, um, uh, by working with youth and adults from the community and having the youth uh, uh, better understand that, well, if we want to solve the cross-border issue, we need to work with our neighbor because we share the same water basin. 
And when the youth uh, uh, comes to meet with the mayor and asks that question of the mayor, the mayor embraces the youth because the youth comes from the community. Um, uh, if we as an environmentalist come to the mayor, there's a little bit of antagonism, uncertainty, you know, what do you want from me? But, but quite naturally, an elected official uh, wants to embrace uh, 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 you know, residents from, from uh, uh, their own community. And in that way, we've seen uh, uh, mayors become leaders. Um, so the big jump uh, into the Jordan is such a classic example where you know, we have Palestinian, Jordanian, Israeli mayors that are not, as Yana said, they're not best friends. In fact, they're in the midst of the conflict, yet they jump into the river together because they know that they have support. Now, is it uh, a majority support? I don't know. But they, they do have vocal voices today from their communities defending their action. They need people to defend them because at the moment, um, uh, the loudest voices are those vo voices that say there's no partner, that we can never make peace, that we can't trust the other side. And it's the same extremist voices that we have on both sides that um, uh, uh, most uh, uh, leadership listens to. So by uh, this bottom-up work, we create a constituency that empowers mayors uh, uh, to lead, for instance. And when uh, the mayors start raising their voices, and the, 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 the Gaza example is perfect because all of the mayors on the Israeli side opposite Gaza signed the same letter. And I, I, I know the mayors personally. We have mayors that are Likud and Israel Beteinu from the right, and we have mayors from the center and mayors from the left. They all signed the same letter because they all understood that their self-interest is at stake. And, uh, uh, and then the ministers responded because this was no longer a divisive partisan issue. It became a bipartisan issue. Um, uh, and, and then ministers changed policies. So um, it is effective um, uh, by that sort of constituency building, showing that this is a bipartisan uh, uh, threat uh, across the board, both internally and cross-border. Um, and I, I think that is the, uh, the lesson. Sure, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, just uh, to follow on the excellent example that Guidon said, you asked about um, ways to, uh, the tools to overcome barriers. And one of the things that, that we found where there's a lot of intense conflict about, say, how a, a forest should be managed or a watershed is one of the things is we take the people out into the forest, into the watershed, so they can see for themselves the degradation, the problems, the fires, whatever the, the issues are that are of the concern. And we also um, get them to talk to the scientists, the experts who can explain what's going on or, or why this landscape that looks the same as it did for your grandfather isn't really a healthy riverbed, that it, it should look different. And even though it's been this way for generations, that it doesn't actually provide the support for the fish or the other ecosystem services that you need. But it's one, getting them out into the landscapes. It's also setting up a, a participatory process where all the, the, the representatives of the different stakeholders have a voice and are engaged in the decision making, are engaged in, in setting the, the goals that are trying to be reached. But no one voice can block things moving forward. So that you, you have a, it's a participatory process, but it's not necessarily a 100% consensus process, because otherwise it's very hard sometimes to get past that one or two maybe individuals who have quite extreme views and, and aren't yet ready to compromise. An another thing that we found is that if you bring people together um, just to a meeting, you can get a lot of um, very strong language, strong arguments. Uh, if you invite them to come with their families, their spouses, their children, to sit and have a meal first together, and then to talk, their language changes. They're much less likely to, to swear at each other in front of their children. And <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm not making this up. I mean, these are, yeah, these are, these are, these are things. They seem like common sense things, but they they really do have an impact. And there are a lot of tools like this that help bring these people together. And when they develop that shared version, that shared vision, they see, as, as 
as has been mentioned, that self-interest. And therefore, they start fighting for it and advocating for it. And then their political leadership starts listening, because it's what the community is telling them needs to be done. Okay, thank you. So time is upon us. So I'm giving you 30 seconds each to get quickly to your um, question, please, and your name and affiliation. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nock Chekham, and I am from Jordan. Uh, recently, the Jordanian government uh, signed an agreement with Russia to build new nuclear power plants in Jordan. And in my understanding, nuclear power plants need a lot of water for cooling purposes. Where will they get the water from, and will it affect your uh, effect efforts? Great. Thank you. Kathleen Mystery with Mystery Advisors. I have clients in the water industry offering technology and solutions. My thoughts today are this is super, but I'm a little confused because this is new to me. Um, are you addressing only the primary water uh, c concerns or also are you exploring the supplemental water solutions? Okay, great. Um, so just two questions quickly. Um, Jordan nuclear power plants and primary water concerns versus supplemental. Um, do you want to? Okay. Um, so for the nuclear in Jordan, it, it's been, um, as you know, uh, um, the government is trying to push forward for the building of a nuclear plant uh, in Jordan for a long time. It does require huge amounts of water that the government uh, cannot identify at this time. Uh, they're thinking of that part of it would be from the desalination plant uh, um, that's due to be built in Aqaba. Um, but they're not able to identify where this water is going to come from, and that's holding uh, back the implementation. Um, we're definitely against building of a nuclear plant as an um, environmental NGO, uh, and we are trying to fight it with, with others in Jordan as well. So, so I'm not really clear as to w what you're referring to in, uh, in primary and supplemental. Okay, so 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 uh, th that is that is just another way of manufacturing uh, uh, water by by taking it out of the air. Now, th the the cheapest large scale uh, uh, means of manufacturing water at the moment is desalination, and and uh, he hence we're heavily discussing desalination. I want to highlight though that desalination should be your last choice, not your first choice. We need to make sure that we're managing the scarce water resources that we have in the most efficient w manner before um, we turn to desalination. So you know, we had the, uh, Jan and I were in uh, uh, Los Angeles before coming here. And Los Angeles has determined that it can delay desalination by 25 years if it starts to invest more, and, it, and it's planning to, uh, in m much more efficient uh, current water use. So you know, uh, uh, Los Angeles presently treats its sewerage and then it flows into the Pacific. It's not being reused for agriculture, which is an un unfortunate waste. And Los Angeles is, is indeed uh, going to uh, now utilize treated wastewater. And this needs to become the model across the world. In all water scarce areas, we need to stop seeing sewerage as something that we treat and we uh, uh, throw back, um, seeing it as a waste. No, it's a resource, it's a valuable resource. You're cutting down on water losses. Most cities around the world lose 30, 40 percent of their water just by poor investment in infrastructure. So, you know, Los Angeles is doing really well. Israel is doing really well. We're at seven, nine percent water loss. World leadership. Um, uh, we need to make sure that we're all doing a hell of a lot better and uh, no less important price. You know, water is not free. Yes, it, 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 it's fallen from heaven but it doesn't mean that it's a gift. It, it costs money. Uh, the private sector that, that is involved in, in much of the water sector needs to have a profitable uh, uh, return. Um, we need to make sure that you know, we have closed uh, water economies with 
keeping in mind that, that water can never be denied, so there needs to be you know, sort of balances in place. But if water continues to be subsidized, which it is in many parts of the world, um, then we get tremendous inefficiencies and waste, um, and we lose opportunity. So you know, all of those uh, factors are critical if we're, if we're going to manage our water resources successfully. Thank you. Shira, any final comments you would like to make? Uh, just a message of, I guess, of hope that there, there are opportunities. Um, there are opportunities for development to increase livelihoods in a sustainable way. It doesn't have to mean that you are dooming yourself to not having water. Um, if you want economic development, the tools are there, the knowledge is there, the technology a lot of it already exists. But we need to build capacity, we need to build leadership, and we need to have approaches that recognize the, the interdependencies and, and that build on them so that cooperation is in the, the self-interest of all the, the parties, the countries, the communities involved. Wow, so we've, we've covered a lot of ground uh, this morning. I think one of the things that we really focused on in, on our discussion was looking at this model that we know Eco Peace Middle East is implementing. We've talked about this model being both a top-down and, and, and bottom-up approach, really focused on local engagement, education. Um, some important um, considerations as I think Eco Peace Middle East implemented this model was recognizing that nature knows no borders. I think we heard this repeatedly, that was an important important vision that informs their work, but also having a sense of the historical image. I think the, f the, the photograph that you presented in those images are, are quite compelling. This, this model of a good water neighbors was important. How do you roll this out? How do you operationalize this? What does that mean? And what does it mean also in terms of youth engagement? We heard about youth water trustees and also the gender dimensions. We heard that cost in this context is not gender equivalent. So we have a very interesting and exciting and unique model that we talked about as a way of building trust, of building cohesion, but it takes time. It's a leadership by example. It's shared access to data and information. There's greater cooperation around among larger groupings. Um, and this is not always one that corresponds to political time frames. So it's particularly difficult in, in that context. And I think coming out of the discussion, some of the takeaways that, that I have is um, you know, the statement that we cannot disengage from a shared environment, regardless of where we, a we end up, we cannot disengage from that perspective. I was quite compelled by the statement that Gidon made in talking about climate change and the underestimation of the impact of, of climate change on the ground. And his statement was that we're not taking the water of our grandchildren, we're taking the water of our children. So we talk about the intergenerational responsibility, but there's a sense of the acceleration of these impacts and recognizing that there is a real sense of urgency, but at the same time, putting at the forefront, water cannot wait, and recognizing that water is being held hostage to the failure to agree on other key critical issues in the region. Water is not free. There's a need to price it, and there's a need to think of closed water economies. So very important pricing and economic dimension that really um, what came up in how we talked about how we engage communities and security dimensions. And this came out in our discussion about livelihoods. And then how do we make that a question about our interests? So your water's neighbor insecurity becomes a question of your national security. So this brought up the question of scales. How do we look at this? How do we address this at different scales? We were reminded that the conflict and in institutional building at a local scale was particularly important and that we needed to recognize that. Ultimately, it led us to this point where there was a recognition of some of the health 
dimensions and the health threats, we are on the front lines, and this was directly tied to our self-interest, but that there were opportunities for mutual gain uh, that led to interdependencies at the regional level. But at the same time, there were opportunities for mayors to lead by building constituents who can empower them and provide an in additional impetus and voice to help them take courage and, and take action. Wow, you guys Brilliant. covered amazing. <laughs> so please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs> So I'm sure next year we'll have EcoPeace uh, uh, Middle East again with us. Please keep tuned and please tune into newsecuritybeat.org where we continue to highlight uh, the important work that's happening around water and, and security. Thanks very much.